Hello, everybody. I'm Dan Jurgen, and uh, very pleased to welcome you now to a discussion with Dr. Rajiv Kumar, who is Vice Chairman of Niti Iyog, uh, and also Chancellor of Gokhale Institute of Economics and Policy. He's very much at the center of India's energy future. And uh, Dr. Kumar, uh, welcome to uh, India Energy Forum. Hi, Dan. Good to see you. Good to see you again. Do virtually. And thank, yeah, virtually. And thank you again for leading uh, a superb uh, CEO roundtable with the Honorable Prime Minister yesterday. It was a very rich discussion, and the comments of the Prime Minister were most welcome. So thank you for that. Uh, I thought we'd, we'd talk about some general questions about the India's economy and then turn to some energy questions. And I might simply want to start with you have your finger on the economy. Where do you put India in terms of economic recovery uh, now? I think we've seen the worst. Uh, we've got the worst behind us, Daniel. Uh, you know that we had a very bad first quarter this year. And, but now we've seen uh, many, uh, not just green shoots, but green uh, stems of uh, recovery. All the uh, high frequency indicators like uh, railway freight, um, you know, air passenger traffic, tractor sales, auto sales, fertilizer consumption, including power de energy power demand, you know, is now they're, they're, they're clocking a slight growth above last year, year on year, they are doing you know, better, not, you know, some of them uh, substantially better, uh, which is a very good sign. And some of these, I think that these are, things are coming back. Uh, uh, we've also seen a recovery on, um, you know, some of the numbers like agricultural growth and, 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 and our agricultural harvest is good. So what I'm expecting is that the, uh, you know, we are now in the third quarter. We do, we run a fiscal year, April to March, and our April to June was disastrous. Of course, in June to uh, September is the number that are going to come out, which I think will be much, will be negative, will, but, but much smaller negative. And the third and the fourth quarter, uh, that is the second half of this year, uh, we will uh, we'll end up with a positive number in recovery. So 2021, though will be a negative uh, you know, uh, growth, will be a decline in our GDP. But then, it, given all the reforms that have been taken in this period, I expect the fiscal 21-22 uh, to be a much stronger recovery uh, and hoping that we will at least recover all the decline that we've had in this fiscal year, at least that much. Right. So that might be that in 2022 is that India's growth rate will again, and its GDP will exceed where it was in 2019. That would be a reasonable expectation. I'm hoping so. But, uh, you know, right. and it's, I'm hoping so on very sort of solid grounds because uh, we, have, we have, as led by the Prime Minister, used the six, seven months uh, as an opportunity to make, to undertake some very deep structural reforms in areas like agriculture and labor reforms and pricing of products and FDI, you know, automatic, you know, attracting FDI, uh, the coal, coal sector reform, the mining reforms. And all of that will enable us uh, to have a recovery which is which is strong, which is robust, and then which is sustained. So I, you're right. We are hoping that by the end of fiscal year 21-22, that is in March 2022, we would be slightly ahead of what we were in March 2020, and which is I think will be better than large parts of the global economy. Uh, you know, where I think we will, we may take a while uh, to get back to the levels and to get back to pre-COVID levels, uh, given what I'm seeing in the advanced economy. But this, all, all of this, of course, then as you would agree, depends entirely on how the pandemic plays out. We have we've yes, done very course. well in that, uh, in, in ourselves. We've got the lowest mortality and the effective rates and highest recovery rates. Uh, it seems that we've, you know, we've gone past the peak, well past the peak, and our numbers are declining. Uh, but this is this is pure uncertainty. You know, we don't know uh, how will this, uh, you know, work out, and it'll depend a lot on that. So during this period of COVID, you talked about the deep uh, economic reforms, 
what have been the priorities of uh, NITI uh, EOG uh, itself uh, over the last seven or eight months? We have uh, we worked very closely with other line ministries and we've focused our attention one on agricultural sector reforms. You know, we wanted to liberate our farmers uh, from the stranglehold of the uh, so-called mandis, the markets, the organized markets, so that give them the freedom to sell to whom they like and where they like and at whichever part of the country they like. And so that's been a big reform that has happened. We've also followed that up with permitting contract farming uh, so that the uh, farmers can again get into a purchase, buying, selling agreements with, you know, with the people, companies who want to add value to their products. Only so far, just 10% of our agricultural output is value added. We want to ramp that up. And we've also amended the Essential Commodities Act so that we've taken, you know, most of these, you know, commodity, agricultural commodity out of that so that traders can now stock uh, their commodities uh, and be prepared to export them. So that we, we are, so that's one very big reform that we've had. We've also done some amazing work, I think, in the labor sector, where we have codified a plethora of reforms, 29 central reforms, 200 odd state government reforms into four codes. And I think the, the high point of that is that we have, we have raised the number of uh, workers beyond which companies had to take the permission of the government uh, to lay them off uh, from 100 to 300 and given the states the freedom uh, to go beyond that if they wanted to you know and and to and, and to whatever level they decide uh, we've uh, put in put in place some very strong social security measures we have permitted the employment of contract workers on the same terms as regular workers so the labor market flexibility which had been a bane of our you know which had been a sort of demand by a lot of investors in our, you know, in coming into our country has finally been achieved. I think so. That's the second one that we've got. And the third, of course, is the improvement in the ease of doing business. And I think that's where again we have led uh, from the front in the IO. We have been, uh, you know, uh, we have. I, I chaired three committees: one on hydrocarbons, the other on coal sector, the third on mining sector. And in all three, we have switched from. Uh, trying to maximize government revenue uh, to maximizing government to maximizing production and investment. And we have made the environment in all of these three sectors far more investor friendly than what it was. Now I don't want to get into details, but just one sort of you know thing, for example, in the mine in the coal sector, we have uh, removed the distinction distinction between commercial and captive mining. So everybody who mines coal can sell to anybody they want to and, and, and don't have to sort of use it for their own uh, own purposes, et cetera. And uh, what we've done in coal and as, as would happen in mines is that if you are going to be producing ahead of the schedule that you submitted to the regulator, we give you incentives, you know, to, uh, to, to, to give you a lower rate of royalty and, and so on. And those are the, or a lower production sharing so that you can maximize and speed up your production. So the government has switched completely from a revenue maximization mindset to an output employment maximizing growth mindset. And these are the sort of things that we've been focusing on the last six, seven months. And there are others, the education policy. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a revolution that, that, we have, you know, that has been announced. Uh, and because we know that our human resources are, are our major uh, you know, bet, and we have now made it Far more, uh, you know, flexible, modernized, and given them the given the, uh, you know, autonomy to our higher institutes to pursue their curriculum and hire the faculty that they want, uh, and with a very light-handed uh, touch of regulation over them. So these are some of the things that we've been doing in these last seven months, urged by the prime minister to convert the crisis into an opportunity. I mean, this is a very big agenda to accomplish in the midst of a crisis, and uh, it takes quite a lot of uh, mobilization uh, to make it happen. Ooh. So uh, you guys have been very busy. Well, we've tried to be, and uh, you know, uh, and, and, and thank you for saying that, but, but, the, but, the, but the good thing is, the more amazing thing is that there's still more in the pipeline, which you will hear you know, sooner rather than later. 
because uh, you know we we've said that we shouldn't get uh, demotivated by the decline in our gdp but that's something that was inevitable we had to balance lives versus livelihoods and we've done thankfully very well on both and we've had to save lives and ramp up our health infrastructure uh, but we've used this time in which our economy has uh, you know sort of uh, you know suffered with this pandemic the, the negative impact of it uh, to try and get into much better shape uh, and so that when the recovery does come it is robust and sustainable for the next few years right what would be your uh, within the reform package have you focused on international companies bringing them into india facilitating uh, you mentioned obviously on employment uh is that been a focus as well for direct investment yes um, thank you so much for asking that because uh, i should have mentioned this myself because we know that the international companies are trying to de-risk themselves and they're trying to reduce the you know the concentration that they've had in any particular country and we want to therefore get into the global and regional production chains and for that what we got is a is a historically first time uh, a scheme called production linked incentive uh, scheme that you know that we've got which is that we will give we will incentivize a global company which come to india or indian companies which agree to have global scale of production and global competitiveness and we will and there is a very large uh, you know fiscal incentive that is being given uh, to these companies and what we've done and for Uh, sectors have already been announced. The cabinet has approved that, and these are pharmaceuticals, uh, mobile phones, medical devices, and the fourth one I I forget it slips my mind, but the electronics, yeah, components. So those are the four. Another six will be announced very soon. And here, what we're saying is that we are we are we are putting them out as a competition among the states, you know, which says that you will get this much grant from the central government if you can attract. these global scale companies to your to your uh, jurisdiction by offering them incentives like land and regulation regu- like regulatory touch etc etc so i think this is a very big breakthrough because you've never tried this before and you've always been a bit wary of working with individual companies but you know and 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 and, and the result is that the apple has moved in and it started and put up a huge facility in near pune you know and from where they are now bringing their own component supply as well and beginning to export you know and they are promising that they will invest up to close to 10 billion dollars as we go forward in that in that in that facility and make india one of the export hubs so it's working it's beginning to work and i think right. we will see a lot of action here going forward so so and obviously to make that work addressing logistics is a very important part of that in terms of Uh, yes. being able to facilitate that right yes, absolutely um, logistics is a, is a very important part and the railways yeah. and the uh, surface uh, transport ministries are both at it in terms of uh, trying to you know trying to facil- improve the logistics and reduce the costs of logistics in the country uh, and right. uh, you know and, yeah so uh one of our uh major areas of study now that I'm particularly focused on with my colleague Atul Arya is what we call new supply chains for the net zero carbon economy and we think that uh there's not a very clear understanding of the scale of supply chains and I'd like to you know we're not only as, as vice chairman of Niti Aayog but also as a distinguished economist as a somebody who spent 10 years at the Asian Development Bank just how you th- have seen the evolution and your thinking about supply chains in the global economy and india's role in that india danny i have to be candid on this that we have not been able to take great advantage of the global or regional production chains because of this uh, other well known phenomena of the missing middle in our country and the missing middle refers to the fact that we have either some very large companies and then we have a, a huge ocean of very small companies something like 65 you know million of those etc but there is the missing middle because we don't have companies which are large enough to get in, in integrated with the global supply chains and become globally competitive and that's what we have tried to do and within these again these six months 
the government has taken a bold step in announcing uh, some very liberal uh, re regime, a very liberal, uh, you know, sort of definition for our small and medium enterprises. We have raised them 10 times, you know, from uh, whatever they were, you know, from 550 million to 500 million rupees, so that now they can have much bigger turnover and much bigger investment and yet enjoy the preferences that were given to small and medium enterprises in terms of interest rate subvention or, you know, and, and, and things like that. So that's what we are trying. That's one. The second, of course, that I mentioned to you is this production-linked incentive scheme, you know, where, again, when the six more sectors like auto components and others are announced, you will see that they will bring in, you know, these uh, companies which are, you know, capable of integrating a regional and global production chains. But I think the one that I wanted to point out to you is our supply chain for agro-processed foods. You know, that's, uh, that's an area where it should not receive as much attention as it should, because India has got all the agro-climatic conditions within it. And, in, and, and if we can make our agriculture globally competitive, which we must, and then bring in companies which can add value to that agricultural output, to that, that very huge, diverse agricultural output. And in this regard, just one last word to say that in Niti Aayog, we've been very focused on trying to make Indian agriculture agroecologically uh, you know, compatible. We are, I am pushing very hard, and the Prime Minister has mentioned it twice already, twice in the Parliament, I think, that India will be moving towards a zero chemical-based agriculture. You know, and, and that's something that we're pushing very hard on. And, uh, and already, I think about, uh, you know, I, I think at least seven, six to seven million farmers are adopting this already. Zero chemicals, no chemical fertilizer, no VDCide, no pesticide, and all of this, you know, being produced, uh, you know, through use of organic, uh, you know, uh, organic uh, fertilizers, or even better, by reactivating the microbial activity in the soil and, and, and getting back the organic, the, the increasing the organic carbon content in the soil by fixing it from the atmosphere. Now, that's a huge right. thing that we could, you know, in terms of green growth, if we can achieve that, and the value that's being given to that globally now, I think uh, in, you will see India contributing both to the growth, plus also very positively to reducing the carbon content in the atmosphere. And that can be done at a massive scale, you know, uh, and that, that's what we're trying to do and really scale it out. That's a very distinctive contribution. And uh, I've not heard of any other country with that kind of focus and uh, bringing the skills and capability because that involves not only your farmers, but of course it also involves your scientists. So uh, that's an impressive initiative. Uh, we held a two day webinar, 600 people participated, the entire agriculture scientist community, the so-called Indian Council of Agricultural Research, it was addressed by the Minister for Agriculture uh, and other, you know, and successful farmers who were who trying this out. And we are now really on the cusp of trying to roll out schemes which will take it into all, con all parts of our country, into 10% of our blocks, 600 blocks, where we want to show them as model farms for all the other farmers to adopt them. Well, that's, that's very impressive. And uh, I guess, uh, uh, this is something the rest of the world needs to know about what India is doing there. Let me just ask you in the time we have uh, just a couple more questions. One is the prime minister, of course, had, has previously spoken about moving from command and control to plug and play in the global economy. And you've described some of that with supply chains. What, how should the rest of the world interpret his, this, his emphasis now on what he calls uh, self-reliant? Uh, that's, you know, what does that mean in the 21st century context for India? And self-reliance simply means that we will, we will, we will not let our import dependence become a constraint on us. That we will produce and we will uh, take care of our comparative advantage well enough to be able to earn enough foreign exchange uh, to pay for our necessary imports, while remaining completely plugged in to the global economy. Self-reliance does not mean 
isolation or self sufficiency not not even by a long shot self reliance is the sort of self reliance that the koreans had or the japanese had or you know if you like the americans have had uh, which is simply to say that we want to we want to reinforce our competitive strengths we want to make sure that we don't we you know that our domestic entrepreneurs or those who want to produce in india get the same level playing field as they would get otherwise so that our entrepreneurs don't desert us and don't go into other locations and in fact the reverse that we are able to attract more foreign investment and our own non resident indians back to india and make india an innovative uh, you know hub make india a startup country and make india you know go into areas which so far we have in some sense uh, you know um, effectively neglected and for no reason and the prime example is for you know is, is, is let's say furniture i mean there's just no reason in the world where our amazing craft people can't produce the furniture that we need but we've ended up producing you importing uh, you know billions of it and i my favorite example is actually that we throw away in the season our tomatoes but we import 3000 crore worth of tomato puree for our pizza toppings Now, that's that, that's that, that is easily yeah. can be done at home and why would you not why would you want not want us to do it so that's the meaning of self reliance an open india a liberal india but an india which is looking for emphasizing and 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 using its competitive and comparative strengths rather than you know sort of neglecting them and wasting them right and you make that point of course the non resident indians i mean we can see the extraordinary impact they're having on the united states and using yes. and bringing that cap entrepreneurial skill back to india so yes yes absolutely well, let me ask, yeah uh let me ask you just switch to energy for the last couple of minutes here and in particular the gst tax and energy uh how how you're proceeding on that and uh what you want to achieve then i think um, it's time uh, that we moved our energy sector under the gst regime also because i think that will be a very big step forward i know that there are uh, complications because it also the states levy their own taxes on the energy especially on gas and so on but i think you know in terms of making you know making gas the long term gain in india as a cleaner fuel and doubling its more than doubling its share by 2030 from the current 6% to 15% i think what you need is uh, to unify these taxes universalize them and bring them lower rather than have this range of 3% in one state to 24% in the other and gst offers us that and i think that's therefore is an opportunity where i think uh, we should be going to and at the same time along with the gst i think we also need to move towards a market determined price regime you know where the price discovery is done by market and not controlled administratively you know, and we want to move to a light touch and a, you know arms length pricing regime and i think the sooner we do that in my view the better off we would be because what you mentioned that will help us bring down energy costs for our enterprises to become globally competitive and that's what we need in this country to expand employment but otherwise we won't be able to generate the level of employment that we need right maybe as a last question to ask you uh, yesterday we heard the prime minister describe the seven horses that will pull the golden yeah. chariot of uh, uh, energy and uh, i think that was a very um, powerful uh, image uh, where where do you think india is farthest along right now and what what area do you think which horse needs to go faster well um i i think uh, the horse that needs to go faster is to reduce our reliance on fossil fuels because you know we are still you know heavily dependent on that especially coal and so that what we need is you know newer uh, technologies there but what we have done very well is already in one of the horses is the renewables You know, we have, uh, you know, we've really installed a lot of capacity on the renewables. Uh, I think we are on track to achieving a 450 gigawatt by 2030. More importantly than that, I think 
we are now beginning to get storage technology at very competitive rates. So that renewable fuel storage, which then help us to overcome the intermittency of the renewable supply, I think is, is very, and that's where we've gone further. The last tender that we had had incredible price bids for you know, renewal plus storage. So I think that's where we've also gone. And, uh, under the, uh, this production link incentive scheme, we are attracting uh, you know, producers of uh, lithium ion batteries and other chemicals you know, for renewables. So that's where we've gone the furthest. Uh, where we need to go faster is one, as I said, uh, you know, on, uh, on dependence on fossil fuel. And I think uh, the other one that he's talked about was, uh, uh, you know, our reduced import dependence. Uh, and we, right. here yeah. we can do biofuels much more and waste energy. I think mean, that's where we need to take more strides moving forward. But just in, let you know that the imagery of the sun god chariot is an incredible one for the Indians. Because the you know sun god actually the myth has he has a seven horse chariot all white steed and blazing away. So you know with the solar energy as being our exactly. you know, limb of it, I think that's the one to go for. He chose it it's well. It's a great it's, it's a great uh, image, uh, Dr. Kumar. Uh, this has been a really uh, very valuable and uh, deeply informative discussion. We can, as you particularly as you describe the wide range of uh, reforms that uh, India has been pursuing uh, during this COVID crisis and how that is fundamental to India building back stronger and bringing GDP and getting back on that high growth uh, turnpike that the Prime Minister talked about. And uh, Niti uh, Eog has been very much a, a dynamo for reforms and for pursuing that. And uh, thank you very much uh, and congratulate you on what, what you all have been doing. And thank you very much for sharing your uh, wide ranging perspectives on these subjects. And we wish you all the best. Thank you very much, Dan, for giving me this opportunity. Thank much you. time. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Thank you. Bye for now. Thank you.